Hi everyone. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background in terms of being an explorer in astrophotography. I am fortunate, this has been the ride of my life, to be able to have begun my career and activity in astrophotography at the time that CCD imaging was just starting to become available in the world of uh, amateurs. And for me that was exciting because um, I was developing programs. My first job outside of college was I worked at the National Observatory at Kitt Peak um, in the late 90s and I was developing the public programs there. What I created when I was there was an astrophotography program dedicated just to have people come and visit, accommodate people that would visit and want to take pictures of space. At the time, I think that that was uh, one of a kind in the world. I don't know of any other observatories that were offering such a program. One of the cool things about that program at Kitt Peak was that at that time you could point the telescope almost anywhere in the sky and take a referential picture because there just weren't very deep images, since film didn't really allow for that, um, of many of even the well-known bright things in the sky. So it was a great time just to take pictures of space over and over and over again and I had a great time with the visitors that came to me. One of the things though that would happen is like this picture here, this is of NGC 1215, was I was able to suggest, hey let's take a picture of something other than the Whirlpool Galaxy and the Orion Nebula, a picture where there just may not be another uh, you know nice picture of it and even today this particular group of galaxies, uh, NGC 1215, doesn't have a very nice high resolution color picture, but, uh, and hopefully someday I'll get a chance to visit this again. Um, but this is exactly the kind of image that, you know, 20 years ago or so, um, I was taking pictures, short exposures. Today, no longer would people spend just a couple of hours like this, but they would spend a couple of days or nights at a minimum to get enough data to produce images. And of course, today, now, if you want to take a picture where there aren't references everywhere, where someone hasn't taken, uh, you know, people haven't taken thousands of pictures of things, they tend to be small or faint, or you have to be a little creative about taking those kinds of images in astrophotography. Uh, so as an explorer, I still search out some of those places, and I have an image uh, that I'd like to show you that I just recently took and processed uh, that is exactly of that type. So you can see that common thread through time. Another really good example of the potential of images, and this is something again that motivates me and I look for, is an object that I worked on called uh, SH239. Now the fact that it has this different catalog, it's called the Sharpless catalog, this is an image that I, uh, that I worked on some 10 years later because in the intervening, uh, intervening decade, uh, CCD imaging really caught on in the amateur world and people were taking pictures of everything in the sky, especially all the bright stuff, the Messier objects in the NGC catalog. So seeking out these other catalogs uh, to find these faint things that perhaps again haven't been explored, this is an example. Now this example is one where it is astrophysically interesting. There were actually papers that predate my uh, color picture of it but there weren't any color pictures. So one of the cool things, again, that um, would motivate me is whenever there's something interesting that astronomers are studying, it's always great to have a picture to look at. And there just weren't very many pictures of this object. In fact, at the time, you would see images just like this, where you see some dim thing, and images at that time, uh, you know, 10 years ago or so, there wasn't an easy way to adjust the data you would have just a single static image that you couldn't adjust. You couldn't see if there was anything more there. Nowadays, with tools exactly like this, you actually can make an adjustment to the, uh, to the image and perhaps get a, a hint that there's more there than meets the eye, uh, that there might be a worthy goal here to spend hours and hours both collecting enough data as well as processing that to end up with something that is captivating, that is interesting. I took a chance on this one. I thought this was an interesting one because there just weren't any other color pictures of it. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I really, really didn't know. Uh, but this is one of the images that surprised me the most. It was just really, really remarkable what the final result looked like. So this is the result that I got.
I mean, j compared to what you first see in these kind of um, not deep images and they're not full color, I mean, th this just was amazing to me. And it really sparked, again, that interest in finding these kinds of things and exploring the universe around us. It just uh, really, really met all of those kinds of goals, ticked off all those boxes for me. So this image I took later, I uh, founded the uh, Mount Lemmon Sky Center at the University of Arizona, and it is with telescopes there that I uh, you know, put into place and commissioned that I was able to, again, through another astrophotography program, to generate imagery that was of this kind. And you can see, because you know, 10 or more years had passed, this I think is uh, you know, 10 or more years ago, um, that the improvement in the cameras, in the processing, in the amount of time that was spent, all of that obviously created uh, an even better kind of image quality. And today, of course, you know, uh, even the most uh, kind of simple setups that amateur astronomers are using with the very nice cameras and so on produce just really remarkable images of this kind of quality. This is another field in that same part of the sky. These are objects that are in the Taurus molecular cloud. Uh, but this is an object that, like of the type that I've been describing, I don't believe there are very many other nice high resolution color pictures of this field. And so uh, again, you look at this picture and some of the, and this was, again, I took this a while ago, but um, at the time, there just really weren't any good references. So it looked like just a couple of bright stars with a little wisp around it. Would you spend hours and hours and hours on that? Uh, and the cool thing is that sometimes they are rewarding fields and they're just really remarkable to be able to see what in the world is going on, what in the universe is going on. In fact, I always had hopes, designs, that JWST, that this might be one of the first kinds of objects that they would take a picture of. This is an object that glows uh, warmly, all the dust around these stars is glowing um, in infrared wavelengths of light. So I think this would be a great JWST kind of uh, uh, pretty picture, but you know, who's going to listen to me on that? So uh, as far as galaxies are concerned, more recently, one of the resources that has become available to me is Telescope Live. Telescope Live has telescopes that you can pay for uh, pay for time on in order to collect pictures and uh, uh, you know under with very under the very best skies with really really incredible equipment um, and that as an explorer of course gives me the opportunity to continue this thing uh, and this particular galaxy NGC 3561 again the NGC catalog is just a finite list of things but surprisingly I mean I found it surprising this is a spectacular galaxy it's not very large but uh, there just really weren't that many nice broadband high resolution pictures of it. So I spent a lot of time and some money on this and uh, this is the result. So it made me really, really happy. Uh, and that's that explorer sense of uh, the kind of stuff that I think gets me very excited. And so now let me show you uh, how HST has also been an inspiration. HST is the kind of thing where you, you generate these pictures but they're not full color images. So this is an example where you have the red rectangle. Is it really red? I mean, these are color, these are mapped color pictures. Now it is actually really red, but this is not a full color picture. It's, and so the question is, well, what color does it really look like if you take a picture with, you know, the kinds of colors that we see with our eyes, broadband imagery? And so the answer is, yes, it is a red rectangle. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, and surprisingly, you know, this picture here, it was taken in 2004, and I took a nice color picture of it a decade later, but to me, the idea of doing it was as important as actually the result, because th again, there just really weren't very many broadband images of the red rectangle. The HST picture was wonderful, but uh, the idea of checking in on it to actually see what it looks like, even though it's a small object, I think that's almost equal to the uh, resulting image itself. And uh, so with HST then, recently I came across another HST image, this one. This is of NGC 3195. It's a planetary nebula. And uh, so this is a star that is evolved. It's at the end of its life, uh, basically dying. 
It is ejecting its outer shells of gas in the central core. A white dwarf is making these outer uh, exposed and ejected shells of gas glow. But the HST picture, even though it is a fantastic picture, high resolution, and this is an image, it's actually poor data, but uh, Judy Schmidt here cleaned up the HST image to make it look something reasonable, which is good. Uh, but it's actually not all that deep. This picture uh, really doesn't show all that there is. And so that's another kind of perspective. Not all HST pictures show you know, everything. They don't show all the colors and not necessarily all the details uh, because it depends on the, the filters that they use, the amount of time that they spent. So this is probably taken as part of a survey of planetary, image, uh, planetary nebula, but not necessarily the deepest uh, images and not necessarily is it amenable to creating a, a really striking result. So surprisingly, some of the ground-based images of this, I think, kind of hint at uh, some of the interesting aspects of this planetary nebula. Planetary nebula tend to be very colorful because they are ionizing gases and they emit different very specific wavelengths of light, which can lend itself to interesting contrast and features and stuff like that. They're very unique. They're all, every one of them is different, a little sky gem. So the image on the left here is taken with a two meter telescope. But it was taken a long time ago. This would have been taken back in the, I think this was like 1999 or something like that. But you can, you can see hints of uh, interest here. This is probably a narrow band image on the left. And on the right, uh, one of the few kind of amateur images that I found, and it's itself still a pretty old image, uh, was done by Steve Couch, who is in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Steve and I have been doing astrophotography for very, you know, several decades, more than several decades now, uh, but he's always been the Southern Hemisphere guy. Of course, I now have access to the Southern Hemisphere through Telescope Live, whose uh, resources are in Chile. And so that has opened up literally another part of the universe that I haven't had access to. So I thought to myself, here's a pretty object. This is the most Southern planetary nebula, basically bright planetary nebula in the sky. It's uh, very, very near to the Southern uh, pole as we see it from the Earth, the South Celestial Pole. Uh, and then for that reason, I just thought, okay, it's a bookend. It's, it's kind of the thing, the furthest to the South. It's a bright planetary nebula. I thought it might have the potential to look kind of cool, like a ring nebula or any of the others that we see in the Northern Hemisphere, but it just didn't seem to have the kind of uh, uh, publicity that many of the others did. And I want to change that. So here then is my result of uh, NGC 3195. Isn't it pretty? So it shows the different colors. I was able to blend some of that narrow band imaging plus uh, broadband imaging to give the narrow band really helps with the contrast. And now here we can see, I think, all of the elements of this nebula, the details going on inside the central star, its glow, its inner glow, kind of that teal color with the outer red uh, emission of this beautiful bubble of gas. So there you are. Uh, I just linking some past experience in my life to uh, things that I still do today. And uh, again, you can look online, you can uh, go into uh, what Google Images and you can search for NGC 3195. But I think that this image now is kind of a nice one that uh, shows many of the elements that you would look for because I've taken advantage of the very best resources that are available to generate what is now a really, really high resolution color picture of this nebula. So I hope you enjoyed just a little bit of a a slideshow to give a sense of uh, my exploration in astrophotography, and I'll see you again later on the channel.